Okay, uh, Terry Griffiths is uh, sort of a one-of-a-kind person uh, in the sense that she's uh, so focused that um, you know it's, it's kind of hard to, to get her out of her workspace to, to do things like this, but we managed to do it. And uh, she actually comes with a, a lot of demand from others who said that we really need to get Terry's knowledge down and archive it so that others can uh, can learn from her experience. She's worked for the Department of Forestry and Fire Protection for 28 years, specializing in cone and seed processing, testing and storage at the LA Moran Reforestation Center. Most of you probably know that the Reforestation Center no longer grows seedlings, but they, they are the ones that maintain the seed bank uh, for plantings throughout the state. So she's been the manager of the seed bank since 2002. Terry is a registered professional forester and a member of CLFA and the SAF. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Terry. It's all yours. OK, thank you. Um, I want to thank you uh, for the opportunity to talk to all of you about cone crop surveys, why we do them, when we do them, and how we do them. Some of you may already be participating in this annual activity, um, and likely more of you will be doing so in the, the very near future. We're looking for lots of help to get this done. This is the first of two parts of the Cone Survey and Collection Certification Workshop webinar. In part one, um, we're going to review some basic biology, very basic, and some impediments to cone and seed development. We'll also talk about cone crop periodicity and longevity and storage. Um, next, we're going to look at the cone crop surveys and how to assess crop levels. Lastly, we'll take a look at the California tree seed zones and um, offer up some genetic considerations. Uh, Richard, I can't seem to get it to go to the next slide. Oh, thank you. Um, so why does the seed bank exist? Um, there's a lot of things that are happening in our forest now. Um, most native seeds that are used for reforestation and re regeneration are grown from seed. So sufficient quantities are needed to restore and sustain plant communities that are increasingly threatened by stand eliminating wildfire, um, increased disease and pest infestations, the effects of climate change, uh, human impacts, urban encroachment and forest conversions, um, fragmentation by development, and an increase in invasive species. Um, successful seed production requires knowledge of seed development and cleaning and testing and upgrade and storage procedures. The picture in this slide is um, Cuyamaca, and uh, I was there in 2010 uh, and took this picture. And this was um, what it looked like at that time. This was after the Cedar Fire in 2003 and subsequent fires a couple of years later. Um, Lisa Gonzalez Kramer is going to talk about the ongoing efforts to restore uh, Cuyamaca Rancho State Park in a later session. So I'll leave it at that. But um, stand eliminating wildfires aren't new. It, we've had the Fountain Fire, the Story Fire, the Moonlight Fire, um, and the Rim Fire just recently, to just name a few. Terry, yeah. um, Susie is asking you to speak up a little bit. OK. Sorry for the echo, but um, I think I, I just listened to it, and uh, maybe you could speak up just a little bit. I will try. Thanks. And I need to advance the slide. Uh oh. Um. Okay, so cone and seed production are uh, and quality are highly variable from year to year, and they have to be sufficiently evaluated before a collection can be considered. Um, so how do we determine cone and seed needs? Um, the Public Resources Code directs our department to provide an adequate, reliable, and continuous supply of site-adapted seed of the widest possible diversity and the highest quality. Um, but what is reasonable and adequate? Uh, we like to say that we want to have a 10-year supply of each species at different elevations. Um, because of cone crop periodicity concerns, we need to have genetic reserves. Um, we need to have an unexpected need 
those catastrophic events that are happening more than once every 10-year um, session. They're happening nearly every year now. And we also have to have re emergency reserves for the state forests, of which there are more than 75,000 acres. Um, we want to protect the gene genetic integrity of our forests. And why are we doing these collections? Because the conifers don't produce a bountiful crop every single year, and certainly not when we need them to or when we want them to. So there's a lot of planning that goes into having the mandatory reserves of each species at the different zones and elevations in the seed bank for all of those years in between. And quality counts. Why does quality matter? Um, because vigorous site-adapted seedlings come from good quality local seed, and storability is dependent on initial seed quality. Um, we know that good quality seeds will retain viability longer, they have higher storage capacity, and they're less susceptible to damage. You know, I don't seem to be able to advance. There we go. Um, uh, Terry, yes. uh, can you see the, the arrows on the bottom of the screen? Yes. You, to, to advance the slide, you press the arrow. Oh, OK. So um, so that's going back. That's going forward. So you, you press the arrow that's pointed to the right to go forward. I'm sorry. I was using the down arrow um, yeah, that's on my the wrong. keyboard. That's not the right. OK. Yeah, yeah. Got it. Thank you so much. So the registered professional forester and um, resource professionals um, have two main roles in this process that are vitally important. The first one that we're going to talk about today are cone crop surveys, um, which are done on a stand basis in, in each seed zone and across elevation bands. Um, we'll also talk about um, sampling and um, site certification in part two. Um, Foresters and resource professionals will also be uh, asked to help with coordinating sampling. Um, the increased cost of collecting and the difficulty in recruiting collectors makes it imperative that we verify that the developing crop is going to yield enough seed to make a collection worthwhile. So the overall objective is to collect um, the assigned number of bushels when they're available of the best cones um, during that short window of opportunity that we have um, in the, a safe and cost-effective uh, manner. Of course, the most economic way to do this is to collect when the crops are bountiful and the field seed numbers are very high. Many of the factors that we have to consider are what species we're looking at, what crop size do we have in this particular year, um, what is the quantity that's needed? What are the site characteristics? Is it a good quality site? Um, uh, and what is the safety uh, aspect of collecting? What the slope and the ease of collection? And then um, efficiency as well. Cone production differs by species, by location within a species, and by individuals at that location. Good crops. Um, can occur more frequently on a local ba basis. Um, we know that they're very cyclical and they're very localized. Um, we need to identify those periodic masting events that happen very rarely. Um, we may have a good crop um, very locally many, many times over a 10-year period, but we can also have failures in certain areas even when there's an abundant cone crop everywhere else. So it's very important to be looking at the different areas of the state and identifying the cone crops um, where they are. So when we try to figure out how many cones uh, we need for a given amount of species, uh, for a given amount of seed by species, um, we have some basic rules that we follow um, in terms of how many bushels we should collect. So Generally, we receive about a pound of seed, of good quality seed, for, uh, per bushel of pine, um, more than a pound for white fir, less than a pound for red fir and dug fir, and it varies for incense cedar and redwood. Historically, about a half a pound of seed per bushel, and up to a pound to a pound and a half uh, pound per bushel when it's a very good quality year. 
So we have to look at what is the quality in a particular season. Um, we're going to monitor for filled seed count and insect activity. And when do we do this? Or when are the conifers producing? Um, conifers generally fall into one of two categories. They could be one-year species or two-year species. Um, for one-year species, that means that the cones mature in the fall of the same year as pollination um, and fertilization occurs. For two-year species, the cones will mature in the fall of the year after pollination, so about a year and a half later. We want to understand and monitor these processes um, because they're essential to planning a successful cone collection and obtaining an adequate supply of high quality seed. We're going to do a very basic uh, little piece on um, biology here. A, a more detailed discussion is beyond the scope of this presentation. Um, but what we do know is um, in spring every year are the formation and development of buds in mature trees, the same number of lateral bud primordia are initiated e each year. There's just differences in what percent are going to be reproduction, reproductive. rather. The differentiation takes place throughout the first growing season. It's usually apparent by the fall of the first year. Then the buds go dormant, and they burst the following spring. So the first year is after bud burst, um, and the second year is for two-year species is after fertilization. We know that <clears throat> tree nutrition um, plays an important part. Um, good nutrient status always favors good seed crops. Um, there can be stress crops as well, um, but the stress crops you know, need to be accompanied by a good pollen event so that we can see some decent cone crops. But good nutrient status will generally favor good seed crops. Um, this is uh, just a, a diagram that was put together to, to show um, one-year species and two-year species and some of the impediments. Um, so after the formation and development of reproductive buds, that following spring will have pollination and fertilization. This is the cone development year. For one-year species, fertilization closely follows pollination by uh, weeks or less than a month, and then the cones develop through the summer with final development in the late summer and fall. For two-year species, the female ovule continues to grow slowly through the winter, but the pollen tube usually stops in mid to late September. Fertil fertilization occurs the next spring, and then the cones mature in the fall of the second year, about 16 months after pollination. Factors that affect success in this time period are usually weather-driven, a drought or frost, a late frost, excessive winds, or a large amount of rainfall, or even lack of wind. Um, conifers are wind-pollinated, so uh, weather plays a big part in um, success of, of cones being fertilized. Um, some of the impediments that we see are um, insect damage, which can be direct or indirect, meaning they'll damage other parts of the tree. Uh, thrips and sawflies will feed on pollen. Usually the early damage um, causes the cones to abort. So defoliators will eat the buds and the foliage. They might lay their eggs in the buds or attack the buds. Cone beetles will often kill a developing cone by boring into the stalk. Um, you'll see generally you know, brown, hardened little conelets that never did develop. Um, so early damage, we don't see a lot of these insects up close, um, so we know less about them than the insects that do damage later on. Um, more is known about those that do the damage later because we can handle them and observe those more closely. Later damage to cones and seeds by larvae that hatch from eggs deposited in the young developing cones, um, usually by munching or mining through the cones. This damage usually fuses the seed to the scale, so it won't open in those areas and we can't extract the seeds. Um, those are you know, typically cone moths and cone worms. Um, there's some um, 
gall midges and scale midges that they do some deforming uh, of the Conan scales. Um, there's uh, one of the handouts is a short list of Conan seed insects that we see on a fairly regular basis. Um, I think that Mike Deliso um, put those on the website earlier. Um, the insects that can cause damage to the cone interiors and the seeds, those often go undetected because the cones usually develop normally, and we don't see them until um, we cut the cones open. Um, this little Douglas fir cone in this picture is showing a pitching response to some insect activity. So some, a lot of times you'll see outward signs of insects, but sometimes seed worms and chalcids, um, they'll be destroying the seed on the inside, but there's no, um, those eggs were deposited when the conelets were, um, the bracts had opened barely when they were being pollinated, and so the insects are already inside developing, and, and we don't see boring holes or frass or pitch exudation on those. Um, the, the cone on the upper left, that's cone damage done by a western spruce budworm. So you can see that the worm has really mined through this cone. Um, there's frass, it's disfigured, um, there's holes everywhere. Um, sadly, they can do a lot of damage. Um, and we call collections off continually because of heavy damage by um, cone worms. On the lower left, um, that's our, our, the usual suspect Eurycteria, munching on buds. Um, and on the right, those are Douglas fir cones that were um, infested by some cone scale midges and gall midges. And, and they create little galls where the seeds should be. And cause damage. There's a lot of good cone with filled seed here as well, but many of the cones also um, damaged a good 50 to 75 or more percent of the cone. Major seed feeders um, are uh, Lasparegia, which is a seed worm, Megastigmus, those are chalcids, Contrabinia, which is a cone scale midge, and Leptoglossus, a seed bug that has sucking mouth parts. They usually cause um, internal tissues to collapse. Again, I would refer you to look at the cone and seed insects chart that um, we put together, and, and hopefully that's uh, available as a handout um, as a part of this webinar series. Other impediments, um, seed-borne fungus. Seed fungus spores are always present. They just need the right conditions uh, for growth and spread. And they generally cause losses in the nursery. And they certainly affect the storability and the viability of seed. Um, so you know, generally, if there's a lot of mold issues, um, we're going to have some trouble down the line. Squirrels. Contrary to popular belief, um, they don't always pick the best cones, and they don't wait for them to mature properly. They dissect and re remove green cones, and they can uh, destroy 50% or more of a cone crop. Um, they certainly, um, we can see their damage um, in caches, which once upon a time, um, you know, we've got literature that says, you know, how to collect cones from squirrel caches. And um, thankfully, we don't consider squirrel caches um, an appropriate environment to collect cones anymore. I have a picture that shows what that looks like. Um, birds usually don't do a lot of damage to the cones unless they're um, feeding in flocks. That's when we see more serious damage. Um, this is a Clark's nutcracker uh, mining through um, a sugar pine cone here. So larger birds that feed on the developing fruit are just really serious when, they, when there are a lot of them and they're feeding in flocks. Uh, here is a squirrel cache. Um, it's a very um, damp and decayed environment. You can see a high level of debris. Um, squirrel caches often contained diseased seed. Um, the parent trees are unknown. The phenotype, therefore, is unknown. And squirrels also use the same cache year after year. So it's a decayed environment. It's totally undesirable for, for seed consideration. And lastly, um, an impediment that is fairly serious, but one we can do something about, is people. Um, 
people tend to collect too early. And when we collect cones too early, um, in most cases, the seeds cannot develop properly. Green cones and seed are very high in moisture, and they dry too rapidly if they're picked too soon. They haven't completed their normal accumulation of storage food reserves. So we need to make sure that we're leaving the cones on the tree long enough so that they can um, enter the stage that's required for desiccation tolerance and germination again when re rehydration occurs. Um, we know that the amount of seed reserves is fixed when the connection to the parent tree is broken. Um, we used to try to after ripen some cones and you know, sugar pine and red fir can be slowly after ripened if you have a very cool environment, but that's not always the case. And we try to monitor cone and seed production and, and collect them at peak maturity. We know that immature seeds produce less vigorous seedlings. They have reduced germination rates. They have reduced yield and decreased storage per, um, potential. So we want to make sure that we're collecting um, when the cones are properly ripe. Also, um, environmental impacts. Um, all of these create an unhealthy environment for trees. So compaction and climate change effects all are creating unhealthy environments. So people are definitely an impediment. But when are they ready? What time of the year are we looking at? For most conifers, that's the end of summer and into early fall. Um, the general rule is coastal and lower elevation first. Um, the earliest we've ever collected some coastal dug fir was July 31st. But generally, we start looking for collections um, to be ripe about early to mid-August. But um, collections are very, very weather dependent, so there's really no, um, you know, we can't tell you specific dates when, when cones are going to be ready. It all depends on if we had, um, you know, a good spring and if the summer is extra warm, um, things will speed up. So we have to watch weather very, very cl um, closely. Um, Ceratinus species um, have their own schedule. Um, the cones are persistent, so the goal is to pick the current year cones uh, up to and not more than four years old. Um, we find that they tend to not be in good condition if they're more than four or five years old, or the cones may have partially opened and closed. Giant sequoia is... Um, a special consideration, and we'll talk more about giant sequoia in part two. They attain nearly a full size in the first growing season, a full year before they're physiologically ready. So if um, collectors are looking to do a collection in the fall, it's very important to make certain that we're not collecting green cones that uh, don't have embryos that have properly developed. Coast redwoods generally are ripe later in the season. October and through November are typical um, dates and um, oaks and hardwoods can occur any time in the early fall to December. Um, again, very weather dependent. In the temperate zone, the length of the, uh, the juvenile period is extremely varied. Um, and these years that we have listed here are just starting points. Um, the majority of conifers begin flowering at about 10 to 15 years of age, but they might only produce one sex um, uh, of bud. And they don't usually produce significant crops until they're at least 25 or 30 years old. And they're usually pro prolific much later than that. Um, but some species, um, you know, ponderosa pine, 15 to 20 years, would be the earliest we would start looking at a viable cone. Um, sugar pine later, true fir later, um, Douglas fir much later. Um, and giant sequoia, um, we know that the second growth trees on some of the, um, for instance, um, Whitaker Forest, those trees are 140 to 150 years old, and if you compare those to the ancients that are one to a 3,000 years old, they're just not producing at the same level. So um, conifers are very slow-growing and long-lived trees, and we need to let them mature properly um, before they, we expect them to start producing viable cones. So that periodicity is the number of years in between collectible crops. 
Most species don't produce a good seed crop every year, and in some years there are no cones, but how frequent is that? Um, this year-to-year -year variation is called cone crop periodicity. Depending on species, there's usually about three to 10 years between these collectible events, um, sometimes more than that. So we have to combine periodicity and our expectation for storability uh, information to do good collection planning. In records going back to 1958, when you look at the state as a whole, the overall crop ratings aren't usually impressive. Um, the variation is usually happening on a very local level. But the idea is that we are going to collect the maximum amount of cone and seed in those good quality years um, and store them for the years in between when they're not producing. And that's what um, we refer to when we say uh, we have a, seed, a good seed banking system. This is um, just a really short chart with um, years across the x-axis and the cone crop rating from 1 to 5 on the uh, y-axis. Uh, seed quality and quantity is highly variable from year to year, and it needs to be evaluated before collection takes place. It's going to differ by species, by location within the species, and by individuals at the location. Um, these are examples of collectible crops. Um, the rating system is, you know, one is zero cones on um, zero seed trees, and five being lots of cones on lots of trees. Um, so fours and fives are generally the only levels of crop that um, we are looking at when we consider a cone collection. And so examples of collectible crops across the last three decades um, were very good for pine um, in 1980 and 1988, 1991, and again in 2001. For true fur, um, we had a decent crop in 1987 and then nothing really until 2003. In Southern California, there was a little bit of a collection in 2006. For Douglas fir, um, it's really interesting. 1963 was a banner year for Douglas fir and then nothing really until 1982. And then 15 years later, we had another really good crop in 1997, but really there hasn't been a good one since. So it's about 15 years or more for Douglas fir crops. And Coast Redwood, we're still waiting for another good one since 1985. We've had some local, um, not widespread collections. In 2008, there was um, some good production in the Santa Cruz area. And in 2009, we were able to take advantage of some good cone crop in um, the Mendocino area. Southern California pine is, is separate. South of Tehachapi seems to be a whole new world in terms of you know, looking at forests and, and production. So 1978 was a good crop year, um, and nothing really until 2005. Um, in 2012, last year, we had some ponderosa and Jeffrey pine south in the Southern Sierra and the Tehachapi. But really, as you can see from this really simple chart, um, the good crop years are very infrequent. So when we look at um, stor storability and storing seed, the objectives are um, that we have a viable seed supply when it's needed for regeneration and to delay deterioration or at least decrease its rate. Orthodox species tend to have a thick or hard seed coat. Um, that provides good protection. Um, these species are tolerant of desiccation. We can dry them down to a low moisture content and store them for a very long period of time without very much loss of viability. Um, orthodox species are um, pine and Douglas fir. Also orthodox, but a little sub-orthodox, are true fir and incense cedar. They will still tolerate desiccation. We can dry them down, but for shorter periods only. They tend to be more oily, um, and they have resin vesicles or thin seed coats. Um, and they, they tend to not store as long as starchier seeds like pine. The role of the resin vesicle on true fir and incense cedar is to prevent germination in fall. It protects the embryo from excessive drying, 
Um, and, but it's easily damaged. If damage is done to these structures, it reduces germination and storage potential. Recalcitrant species are those that are intolerant of desiccation. That means we can't dry them down, um, and you have to store them at above freezing temperatures, and that means they won't last very long. We tried to hold over oaks because um, you know, we were growing uh, hardwoods at this nursery, at the Reforestation Center, when um, our nursery was open. And again, there might be a good blue oak crop or a valley oak crop maybe once every four or five years. And we tried to, when there was a good mast event, we tried to save some. Um, but we lost about 75 to 90 percent of the acorns that we tried to save because if you can't dry them below 10 percent moisture content, um, keeping them cool in a 35 degree box are perfect conditions for um, mold development. Um, and because we can't suspend the germination activity, um, lots of damage happened to them. They tend to not store well at all. So if the, the seed is collected when it's fully mature and it has good field handling, it's processed carefully and stored correctly, um, we expect cones and seeds to last for a fairly long time. Um, zero degrees Fahrenheit is the temperature of our freezer. And low moisture content, again, is about 5 to 9 percent moisture content. That's the moisture content that the seed is dried to before we can put it into the freezer. So luckily, many of the, the species that we collect and store are orthodox. So periodicity is the main concern. Longevity in uh, storage is a measure of initial seed quality, along with species characteristics, um, such as its morphology and chemistry, um, and genetics, plus proper conditions of storing. Um, there are some species that um, have better fertileness. This is something that's heritable. Um, we want to be sure that we don't do a lot of damage before storage. Um, if we allow the cones and seeds to overheat, for instance, at a high moisture content, um, we'll do a lot of damage to them. Um, we want to make sure that we collect them when they're mature, because immature seeds haven't completed the normal ac accumulation of storage food reserves, nor have they developed all of the needed enzymes for desiccation tolerance. Um, so we want to make sure that they're collected when they're fully mature. We want to know how to be sure we can evaluate maturity levels. Um, and we'll talk about that in part two. We can do some mechanical damage to seeds as well. Um, when they're being collected, if they're dropped from the tree, um, we can do impact damage. And that's usually heavier and larger cones like sugar pine and red fir. Um, if we take an x-ray of some of that seed, you can see the embryo is just broken right in half. And usually that's because the cones have been dropped and not um, bagged in the tree and taken down. We can also do damage when we're processing the cones. So excessive tumbling or dewinging or excessive heat when we kiln the seed, the, the cones, to open the scales. So um, we have to be very careful about breakage and bruising. The storage environment, um, again, correct conditions of low moisture content. And the best range is 5 to 9%. And low temperatures, our freezer is well below freezing at 0 degrees Fahrenheit. So the cone crop surveys. Um, the cone crop rating is the method that we use for expressing the size of the, the potential crop. Um, the general rule is the, the more long-lived and woodiest species is, the less frequent the seed crops are. So we plan to collect enough in those good years to last until the next reasonable crop is expected. Um, so when we're planning um, to do a collection, um, Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, excuse me. So the purpose is to aid in making our collection plans for the short term. Um, it allows us to compare one stand or potential collection area with another. Um, so we're doing um, cone crop surveys by seed zone and elevation. 
Um, it also gives us a history of cone crop periodicity for long-term records. Um, completing the survey um, can be done while you're out doing inspections or other field work. There's really no need for a special trip. You just want to keep plenty of forms in the truck um, and use a separate one for each stand or site observed. The goal is to collect information from as many sites as possible to get a better sense of cone production over a wide area. Um, the system is based on visual observations. We're looking at dominance and co-dominant tree crowns. Um, when uh, we're starting at the top of the tree and moving down, and the overall factor uh, rating is based on two factors. Um, the number of trees that have cones and the number of cones on those individual trees. When planning your routes, you want to keep the sun behind you. Um, so mornings are best for viewing in a westerly direction and late afternoons are best for an easterly direction. Sometimes only okay crops can look better at uh, the midday time. So it's careful, you need to be very careful and not overestimate. So usually early morning or late afternoon are the better times to be um, looking at cone crops. So here are the criteria, um, one through five. One being no cones on any seed trees. Um, this is very subjective. Um, few and many are, are very subjective. You want to look at only that part of the crown that's expected to bear acceptable cones. And this, of course, will vary by species. Um, a very light crop is going to be few cones on less than a quarter of the tree. Um, a light crop, few cones on more than a quarter of the trees. Um, a medium and heavy crop are many cones on many trees. Generally, only the medium and the heavier crops are collectible. Um, so again, look at only that part of the crown that's expected to bear an acceptable um, cone. So the fewer, in, in a, a year when there are fewer cones, they're more likely to be toward the, ha uh, the top of the tree. Um, in a year where there are a heavy number of cones, you'll see the branches will tend to sag under the weight of the, co of the cones. So generally, we're looking from the top down and from the tips of the branches in. The better cones are going to be in the top half of the crown. Um, many cones in the lower half are, are self-pollinated and not desirable. So um, our collectors are going to be looking for cones in the top half of the crown. And when we're doing surveys, that's where we're going to look as well. So we want to avoid the two most common errors that happen when we're looking at cone crops. You don't want to include old cones that have already shed their trees. Many conifers will tend to hang on to cones from last year. And um, you wouldn't believe how many early surveys I get from people who say it's loaded with cones, but um, ack, ack, they're brown. Well, those are last year's cones. And you don't want to look at those. You want to just be looking at the current year um, cones. You also don't want to sample only roadside trees. Roadside trees get more light, and they'll generally have a heavier crop, and they're not representative of what's happening in the rest of the stand. So there's a place on the form that allows you to tell me if we're looking at roadside trees or if we're looking at trees inside the stand. So few and many are, are very subjective, um, but what does that look like? So just an example, 80 to 100 cones per tree for red fir um, or white pine would be rated as many, but it would be that number would be unnoticed on Douglas fir. You would need to see, you know, thousands of cones on a Douglas fir tree, and also a thousand cones on a spruce would be rated as many, but would that would be rated as few on incense cedar. Um, so it's very very subjective. So the procedure is we do the, sur uh, the surveys in summer, um, usually June and July. Um, it's done on a stand basis within each designated seed zone and across different elevation bands inside a seed zone. We want to observe current year cones only. You can see the, sug the sugar pine cones on the, um, on the right. Those are spent cones. Those are from last year. Um, and 
the, the picture on the left, the ponderosa of pine cones that you see on last year's needles, those are the current year cones. You can see, I think you can see, the tiny little conelets on the, the new needles in the, in the terminal position. Those are next year's cones. So we want to make sure we're looking at the current crop um, year. So for purposes of the survey form, stands are, stands are separated by about 200 yards. This large separation is required for wind-pollinated plants. Be careful not to count spent cones. Um, we have to really take good care when we're look, looking at ceratinous cones because they have a unique schedule. Be sure to observe trees within the stand, not just along the side of the road, because they tend to receive more light from all directions. A seed tree means a dominant or a codominant um, of cone-bearing age. It's going to be a minimum 12 inches dBH. It must have a good phenotype, a fast growth rate, high vigor. We'll talk about some of the phenotypic characteristics we'll look at in a later slide. Well distributed means um, that the trees are going to be about 100 to 300 feet apart. Um, and the stands are separated by a minimum of 200 yards. Um, you know, We wouldn't do a survey just on a clump of trees that are um, situated very closely together. Those are likely individuals that are uh, related, and, and we want to look at on a stand level or a multiple stand level when we're looking at cones and doing surveys. So we want to do a separate rating for each species in the stand, and you want to visit at least 10 and up to 20 or 30 well-distributed sites using a separate form at each site. The goal is as many sites as possible to get a representative cross-section. This is um, subalpine fir. Um, and when we're thinking about abundancy, um, what does that look like on different species? So pines will be clustered in uh, three to five at the ends of branches if it's a heavy crop, or many candles at the top of a tree for true fir. Um, Douglas fir and ensign cedar and coast redwood, these trees will have branches that are sagging under the weight of, of a heavy crop of, crop of cones. But are there abundant? number of trees with cones on them. Um, so you can see that this next door neighbor to this subalpine fir on the right, it just didn't have as good cone production. So um, it's, it's quite variable between um, stands, between individual species in the same stand. Um, and when you're looking at a tree, um, trying to accurately describe numbers of trees and abundancy, um, consider that if we are doing a collection, we're generally looking for about 50 bushel of cone. Um, and that needs to come from at least 20 to 25 well-spaced individuals for an average seedlot of about 50 bushels. So you know, we need to see a number of individual trees with good cone crops to consider it um, a medium crop or a heavy crop. And how much is a bushel? Um, that's about eight gallons uh, volume. If you have a five-gallon bucket, about one and a half of a five-gallon bucket. So um, collecting 50 to 75 bushels per seed lot, you know, we need 25 to 35 individual trees with a two bushel per tree maximum standard. So when you're developing your judgment of few and many, you want to confine your attention to that part of the tree that's expected to bear the cones. So for true fir, that's going to be the top branch whorls. And for Douglas fir, we can look at the upper two-thirds of the crown. The true fir cones are going to stand upright like candles in the uppermost whorls. Um, the Douglas fir tree on the right has a fairly moderate um, number of cones on it. So when we're looking at pine in good crop years, there's going to be clusters of cones at the ends of the branches. Um, this ponderosa pine is absolutely phenomenal. I can see seven cones clustered at the end of this branch. There's probably an eighth on the side that we can't see. In a good crop year, it's not uncommon to have three or four sugar pine cones clustered together at the, end of the, uh, at the ends of the top whorls of the tree. 
we're looking usually at the top half of a tree for sugar pine as well. So for incense, cedar, and coast redwood, um, we're looking at the top two-thirds of the, the tree. Um, again, they're very, very small. They're hard to see when they're green. They're, they're easier to see later in the, the season when they start to turn brown. But we're doing surveys while the cones are still green. But you can tell if there's a large crop generally by how the tree looks. It's going to be drooping. The branches are droop, drooping from the weight of the cones. Um, in a normal year, for coast redwood, usually only about 5% of the seed in coast redwood cones are filled. Um, so it's vitally important that we collect only in years of excellent seed production so that we can have a decent yield and maximize economic return. We're going to look at just a few pictures. Um, this might be a good time to break, um, Richard. If, if folks need to catch up with pictures or if they have a question up to now? Um, yeah, Terry, there are some questions. That are, you want to bring those into the, the center, um, Susie, and we'll start with the, the first one from uh, Susie Heffernan. Um, I think you can read that yourself, um, Terry. OK. It is not up to the cone collectors to choose superior trees. Um, Usually, cone crop certification is done by a registered professional forester or a certified silviculturist. Um, in collecting surveys, we're looking at areas of potential um, collection. We're going to do lots of monitoring and collecting samples to make sure that the cones we're looking at have seed in them um, before we do any collection. And we'll also monitor um, insect activity. Uh, let's see. Uh, I need to read the whole question, don't I? Do they look at the same? Well, she's basically asking whether or not it's up to the collector. It is not to up to the collector. This is done by a forester on the ground when the collection is happening. OK, so the forester is going to be saying that tree is superior to this other tree in terms of its potential to produce genetically uh, Correct. favorable offspring. That's correct. OK, now uh, another, you know, just along those lines, there's some cases where what you might, what a forester might favor as a genetically uh, favorable tree might not be what is desired. I mean, for example, we, the people down at uh, Rancho uh, Cayamaca, Cayamaca Rancho, uh, they, they talk about selecting seed from trees that are actually deformed because they might have uh, greater wildlife value. What do, you, what do you think about that? We don't generally choose trees that are deformed for collection purposes. They might leave those trees for wildlife value, but we certainly wouldn't want to collect from them necessarily. Um, okay. I, I think a forester who is from Northern California um, you know, we tend to look at forests in Southern California not as, you know, substandard or second class, but they certainly don't look the same to us. And um, it's not as if we lower our standards when we look at trees down in Southern California forests. But um, they certainly don't generally have the same um, form always, and they don't always have the same level of crop. Um, that we tend to look at it in Northern California. So the two Northern and Southern California areas are entirely different when we're looking at, at, at cones and trees. Um, we're always looking for good phenotype, though. Straight um, bowls, um, good branching, disease-free. Um, we wouldn't collect from cones, uh, from trees that don't have those good phenotypic characteristics. So the cone collection has to be supervised by an RPF or a uh, certified uh, it is. It is done. Yeah. That's what the certification is all about. And a licensed forester or certified silviculturist is on the ground doing that. OK, uh, Dave's got a question. I'm not sure if we have interpreted it correctly. Can you explain what it means to visit 30 to 40 sites in the cone surveys? Well, when you're, usually the surveys are done and you have a predetermined survey route. Um, so you might be covering um, 
you know, an area of the Shasta um, forest, and you'll be driving along a certain highway. Um, you know, I've done quite a few loops through the Forest Hill Divide. I, I tend to get out and do some surveys myself. So, you know, we'll do the whole Forest Hill Divide, and we might stop at 30, 20 or 30 different places along that route. And that's what we mean. That if you're doing a survey of a certain area, you're just following a route. And, you know, get out of your car and go into the stand and observe the stand. And you would fill out a form at every stand. and. Um, stands are considered different if you've moved at least 200 yards. But generally, you know, I, I, I think the, the route that we use in Forest Hill may be, you know, 25 or 30 miles in length, and we're stopping at at least 20 places along that route. That's what's meant by um, having that many sites along a particular route. And we're doing those routes in, in every seed zone, multiple areas in every seed zone. So if you were tasked with doing a cone crop survey in an area, it would probably take you a half a day to drive. You know, last year I did it um, in Amador County, and we went up Highway 88, and we started you know, at 2,000 feet, and we went all the way up to um, um, Capel's Lake. So all along that route, we stopped at several places and did a separate survey at each place where we um, analyzed the trees that we saw at that particular place. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think it, uh, that's interesting. Uh, Mark, uh, actually, the follow-up really is how do you get access to private lands to conduct your surveys? Um, well, <laughs> that can be tricky. Um, we have a fairly good uh, relationship with quite a few industry folks and um, who allow us to do surveys. Um, generally, they're done, you know, driving a route and observing from a road or generally close to where the road is. Um, if you can get onto property, you usually you do have to get permission ahead of time to go onto someone's property. But generally, foresters who are familiar with the local landscape are doing surveys in their area of responsibility, so they're familiar with you know, who the ownerships are and um, you know, who they need to ask to get permission. Um, so it's, it's different in every area, but generally, Folks are doing surveys in areas that they're familiar with, so they know the boundaries, they know the landowners. Um, so that's usually not a problem. And again, you know, Soper Wheeler, Roseburg fruit growers, they're all cooperators, and they all, in fact, they help. You know, they provide information, survey information as well. Uh, Mark Eckbert is commenting on that by saying that you can always work with the local RCD and RCS office Correct. To get access Absolutely. To private landowners. Yeah. Absolutely. And then Christy's got a question here. Um, is it predetermined where a stand starts and oh, stops? Oh no, that's that's totally up to you. If you stop at this place, I mean, we'll get to that when we're actually filling out the survey form. We'll talk about that more um, because you'll provide a motor log of where you went. And you know, if you stopped just beyond such and such bridge or at X mark on highway such and such, that's where you're looking. Um, and on the form, you're going to tell me exactly where you are by township range and section. And if, you're, if you have GPS, then you're also going to be able to provide the latitude and longitude so we can revisit that site if it's determined that there's um, collection potential. Um, but we'll get to that when we look at the actual form itself. OK. Um. And that looks like we've exhausted the questions, so okay. maybe we could go back to the presentation. All right. Well, we're just going to look at a few pictures here before we get to the form. Um, so this one, um, we have two Douglas fir trees. And you can see um, the, the tree on the left. It, actually, that tree is too young to really have a good cone crop. You can see a couple of spent cones from um, a prior year. But um, we don't expect a tree that young to have terrific production. Um, but the tree on the right, you can just see how the, the weight of the branches, um, the weight of the cones on the branches just pulls them down 
So you might, you, you'll need a really good pair of binoculars to, to see the cones clearly, but you can just tell by this tree that there's cone on that tree. Again, here's what few and, and many looks like for Douglas fir. Um, you know, a couple of cones on the ends of a branch aren't going to constitute a very good um, collection potential, but um, many cones. You can see a difference between few and many here. Um, also, while I, uh, well, we're looking at this slide, uh, the Douglas fir is not ripe enough for collection yet. So one of the criteria that we look at with Douglas fir is the bracts, that the exterior bracts on Douglas fir cones will start to turn brown first. Um, and we should see some browning before um, we would consider these cones getting ripe. When we're doing surveys, we're, we're obviously looking at cones that are unripe. Um, but I just wanted, since we had a good picture of Douglas fir here, just to say these cones are not ripe yet. So when we're judging um, maturity factors, that's one thing that you would look at with Douglas fir is the color of the bracts. So on the left, this is a Pacific silver fir with a very heavy crop. That's what that's going to look like on a Pacific silver fir. On the right, this is um, white fir. And this was an overall light to moderate crop in 1984. Um, again, when we're looking at crop levels, try to envision numbers of bushels. Um, collectors have been told that they must they cannot collect more than two bushels per tree, but you would never get a collector to climb a tree unless they can get at least two bushels. So that should give you a, an idea um, when you're looking at a tree, um, how many cones you should be seeing on a tree, um, you know, three, four, five, or more bushels on a tree. And if you see that, then it's, it's going to be in that four or five uh, rating category. So. You know, for sugar pine, um, numbers of cones per bushel, we'll just look at a really quick comparison here. There's going to be about 12 to 18 sugar pine cones per, per bushel. And obviously, um, a sugar pine cone can be 10 inches long, or it can be you know, 25 inches long. So um, it's quite variable. Some bushels only have 10 cones per bushel. For ponderosa pine, there's going to be about 90 to 100 cones per bushel. Um, and for Jeffrey Pine, about half that, about 40 to 60 um, cones, closed cones per bushel. These are all closed cones, folks. Um, white fir, again, depending on size, white fir cones can be about 2 and a half inches long. They can be about 5 inches long, but about 1 to 200 cones in a bushel, um, and five, 50 to 60 cones per bushel for red fir. For Douglas fir, um, you're going to have at least 700 cones per bushel in the Sierra. They're larger than on the coast. Um, there's going to be about 1,000 or more cones per bushel for coastal Douglas fir. So that's just a few numbers. Of, you know, when you're looking at trees and trying to gauge you know, numbers, is it few or many? Just keep those things in mind as well. You know, how many cones are up there in terms of numbers of bushels? I wanted to show this slide. This is uh, in 1984. Um, and it's just a really good picture that you can see um, when you have, when you're above a stand, like if you're in a road cut, and you can look down at the tops of trees. That's always a good vantage point for general observations. You can see in this, well, it's not clear in this picture, but um, you can definitely see the white fur. Um, there's a lot of white fir cone out there. Um, and then if you, if you could pick out the sugar pine uh, trees, they have a good cone crop as well. So generally, if you're up above the stand, that's a great way to see a lot of trees all at once in a stand. Here we are looking at some more true fir. On the left, a light crop. On the right is a more moderate crop. And for coast redwood, um, the tree on the left is a very young tree. You can see some cone on it, but that wouldn't be a tree that would be considered good for collection. Um, on the right, 1985 was a huge bumper crop year over a wide area for coast redwood production. Um, and you can't see the individual cones necessarily, especially from this picture, 
but you can see the trees have a brown cast, and they have definitely drooping branches. So you know, the tree takes on a different look when it's loaded with cones. Here's a close-up of what that coast redwood is looking like if there's a lot of cones on a tree. This was a collection that we did at Jackson Demonstration State Forest in 2009. This is a very poor picture, I'm sorry to say, um, but it's an old one, and it didn't um, digitize very well from an old slide. But essentially, what I wanted you to see is there's ponderosa pine cone on nearly every branch tip on this tree, um, definitely a rating of five. These are sugar pine. Um, on the left is you know, a light to moderate crop. Uh, again, you'll always see multiple cones hanging at the ends of branches if it's, if it's going to be a, a rating of four or five. On the right, there is a moderate to better sugar pine crop here. Um, what's interesting about this photo is this is a blister rust resistant tree. And you can see that the landowner um, has banded the tree to keep squirrels away. Um, and it has also removed a lot of the neighboring trees so that the squirrels couldn't jump over and get to these cones. Um, so the tree removal was protection measures, and banding is protection measures. There's a, a lot of value in these cones, and they don't want to lose them to critters. So um, again, when you open a tree to more light, they generally produce more um, reproductive flowers and will have more um, abundant cone crops more frequently. And that was the idea um, in terms of this blister rest resistant sugar pine. Here's a big cone Douglas fir down in Southern California with a moderate crop in um, 2007. Again, yeah, the environment always looks a little different down there. But this, this is a, a very nice looking big cone Douglas fir tree. And we don't see big cone Douglas fir crops very often. And we did do a nice collection here that year. What I want you to see about this particular slide is this is in Sun Cedar. And it has a heavy crop. You can see it's loaded from top to bottom. Um, but this is an isolated tree. You can see in the background that it's low elevation. There's some gray pine. There's some other scrubby trees. Um, an isolated tree is defined as one that is more than 300 feet away from any other tree of the same species. And it's likely that it's not pollinated um, well. So this is not good genetic material. We wouldn't want to collect from, even though it's loaded, we wouldn't be collecting cone from this tree because it's just too far away that it had good genetic mixing. So finally, here we are to the Cone Crop Survey form. It also is one of the handouts um, that should be available on the webinar website. Um, so you can actually hold it in your hand. Um, so besides the rating, which is about mid-page, one through five, um, all of this information is critical. Uh, again, many survey forms is the goal. Um, you're not just going to cover an entire area and turn in one cone crop survey form. You're going to fill out a form at each stop that you've made. And again, you want to make sure that you know, you're, you've moved to another stand, so you've moved at least 200 yards. Generally, you're, you're driving a route, and it's going to be several miles apart. But um, just so that you know, we, we make sure that we've got good distance between stands. Um, that allows us to get a, a good overall picture of crop level in a general area. So the date first, and your name. The rating is done by you. Um, the seed zone and the elevation that you're at. Um, we're going to be doing cone crop surveys for the species that exist in, in all of the seed zones at different elevations. We don't want to just look at the 4,000 foot elevation or the 5,000 foot elevation. Hopefully, you're starting at a point that's low and moving up the hill so that we're covering most elevation bands. Um, it's important that I have your name and contact information because I need to get a hold of you to ask more questions if it turns out that 
I start to see fours and fives, and it also matches a need in the state seed bank. Again, the surveys are giving us information about potential collection areas, um, and I might receive 1,500 to 2,000 of these survey forms, and I take all of them and, and transpose them onto a master list, and then I compare that with what we what's needed for the seed bank. And if I see a four or a five, and it's a species in a zone and elevation that is needed for the seed bank, you can betcha I'm going to give you a call and we're going to talk about this area more um, because we're going to need to start getting some samples as well, as well. So stand location. You need to be very specific. Um, in, in recent years, more people are giving me lots of good GPS information, um, but it's essential that we have the township range in section. Um, all of the historic records are township range section. Um, you know, we're, we're using the map with the public land survey system, so I can easily identify the place where you are if I have that information. Um, a good motor log is very important. You might be driving along Highway X and you're marking your stopping places at um, you know, a pullout a quarter of a mile from the covered bridge on Road X or, you know, however you want to describe your, the motor log um, that anyone can find this particular place where you were at. It doesn't have to be the exact spot, but um, a good motor log is always a good habit to get into. Um, again, those location and stand elements are necessary if we want to relocate the stand so we can make a determination later that there are actually collectible cones here. Um, the stand observed by, um, if, if you're within the stand, check that box. If you are looking from along a road, make sure you check that box. Um, again, you want to avoid rating only roadside trees, but if you have a good vantage point and you can see much of the stand, then that's okay. But, but do check whether you're in the stand itself or if you're doing this from along the road. Um, the stand condition. Um, This is where you would name limitations. You know, if there's a steep slope or a huge distance from a nearby road, um, if it's not a safe area for collection, um, um, you know, not every area you look at is going to be a potential collection site. Every area you look at is going to be a good survey site, but not necessarily a good collection site. But as much information that you can provide um, is always. Um, it's better to have more information. Again, in this section also, you would want to collect uh, in ownership or boundary information if you know that. Um, you know, what is the likelihood of obtaining permission to collect on this particular property? Um, this is a very important part of the collection process. I spend a lot of time on the telephone and email tracking down landowners and, and trying to get permission, and, and collectors can do the same thing. Again, local foresters usually um, have good information about ownership issues. Um, lots of times landowners will accept a rebate of clean seed um, for the privilege of allowing collections on their site. So a lot of landowners are very open to the possibility of, of collections happening. Um, again, local foresters are the best source, uh, they're the best resource of ownership questions. You, you have unique knowledge of your local area. Keep in mind that the survey uh, reports are reporting areas with collection potential. If these numbers are high, we're going to gather more information to determine if the crop is actually collectible. Um, some of the, the ways that folks do their surveys um, will be by a predetermined survey route. Um, it used to be that CAL FIRE relied exclusively on CAL FIRE foresters um, in each unit to do these surveys, and more and more um, they just have too heavy workloads in other areas, to other many uh, responsibilities, and we're not getting the same good response as we once did. Um, but there, I do have um, predetermined survey routes for a lot of the areas. Um, a lot of folks who are doing surveys send a map. Um, you know, a quad map, um, and it will have the sites that they stopped, the locations that they stopped numbered or highlighted. You could, you know, uh, have a list on a piece of paper that also um, lists your route descriptions, um, 1 through 20 or 1 through 15. 
Um, a map is always good. Pictures, I, I get pictures of <laughs> stands and, and trees. Um, sometimes folks will embed a topo map in the survey form itself. I mean, it, it can range from very simple to, to very elaborate. But always keep in mind that the more information, um, the better. So we're also going to look a little bit about um, the importance of seed source. Um, we know that correct identification of seed source is crucial for survival and growth rate of, our, of the trees that are grown. Um, why do we have seed source? Because it's important to capture adaptation. Trees are going to be on site for decades or even centuries. Um, so we know that you know, local trees are best adapted to the local conditions. Um, if we mismatch an elevation or a geographic origin with a planting site, there are uh, lots of problems that are associated. Um, the, the seedlings will suffer stunted growth or poor form. They may have low drought resistance if they came from an area that was higher than their, their the site where they were planted. They might have a higher susceptibility of insects and disease. They might have uh, frost damage if they burst too soon in the season, if it's something taken from a lower elevation and moved too far up the hill. So the, the components of seed source that we look at are seed zone and elevation. Um, the importance of the source can't be overstated. Um, the trees are not readily adaptable to different environments. Um, Trees that are native to the area are uniquely constituted to withstand local conditions. And how do we do that? We do that with the California um, seed zone map and elevation ranges. So some of the, um, also in your handout, I believe, is a, dis a, a very simple description of the California tree seed zones. But we'll just talk about how we derive the seed zone number. And we'll just call the number um, XYZ. Um, so the X number, the first number, um, so for instance, just think of, of seed zone 5 to 4 as an example. 5 is the X number. And that denotes the broadband um, um, boundaries, the X number boundaries usually follow natural features, such as the crest of a mountain range or rivers, or sometimes they'll follow physical features like highways or railroads or county lines. Um, the seed zone, the seed collection zones and the three-digit method of designating the various zones, they're coordinated with the map and coding system um, that was developed by the Forest Tree Seed Council in 1966. It's, it's been done this way for a very, very long time. Um, the Y number is, a, oh, I'm sorry, going back to the X number, there's six of these regions. So you'll have the um, O90s, that's the coastal area. Um, we'll have the 100 series, um, which is the central coast. We'll have the 300 series, which is the north coast interior, which is the area that extends from the summit of the Siskiyou south to San Francisco Bay. We'll have the 500 series, which is the west slope of the Cascades and the Sierra. Um, we'll have the 700 um, series, which is um, the east slope of the Cascades and the Sierra, which is an extension of the Cascade Mountain Range um, in Oregon and extends down south of the east slope of the Cascades and the Sierra Nevada to the Walker Pass. Um, lastly, we'll have the 900 series, which is a catch-all. Um, that will be the 950s, which is the Great Basin in northeastern California. It'll be the 960s, which is the Central Valley, um, the 980s in the Southern California Desert, and the 990s in the Southern California Mountain Region. Um, so the second number, the Y number, is the subregion. Um, and that denotes it might be the northern or the southern section of a, a region, a major climatic and geographic region. Um, the subregions are usually sep separated by solid red lines. Um, and then the Z number is the individual seed zone. Um, and that number will usually be a one 
to 9. Um, but if the zone ends with a 0, that means it's a unique zone. And that makes it more dissimilar from other zones um, in that particular region. And it's considered its own subzone. So um, examples of subzones are um, seed zone 390, which is Cape Mendocino, um, and more of the zones that you find along the central coast. Um, they're disparate, and, and they are considered unique zones. So the X number broadbands for major physiographic and climatic region boundaries, there are six of those. There are 32 um, subregions, which more clearly delineate soil and climatic differences. And then the individual seed zones were um, arbitrarily divided by about 50 miles in latitude um, just to keep them more local. Um, Those will usually be denoted on the seed zone map by dotted lines. Um, we know that California's climate and topography are very diverse. And these differences are significant to the survival and growth of the trees and the shrubs that we plant in them. Um, so this complexity resulted in the division of uh, the state into 85 separate uh, seed zones. Again, using 524 as an example, um, five in the number represents the 500 series, so it's on the west slope of the Cascades in the Sierra. The two number represents one of the seven subregions of this region, and the four is the actual seed zone in this region. It's an arbitrary unit of the subregion. Here is, are just the, the series. Um, again, if you need a seed zone map, let me know, or you can go to the FRAP website and download um, a seed zone map on the FRAP website. Um, sometimes they disappear from FRAP, and I checked it yesterday, and it was gone, so they're reloading it. Um, so um, if you go to the FRAP website and it's not there, I can send you a PDF. It's just a very large file. So it's better. I have poster size that I can mail to you. I have a PDF I can send you, and hopefully FRAP will get them um, back up on the site. So with the elevation, we're going to keep seeds separate by 500-foot elevation bands. There are obvious differences when we move something from high to low. Um, the trees may lack drought tolerance. They'll have a shorter growing season, so they'll have growth loss. They could be scalded. Um, obvious dis differences when we move something from low to high, they will lack cold tolerance or they'll suffer from frost damage. We want to choose seed and plant stock that is a good environmental match. Um, is the climate at the planting site similar to the climate of source? Um, sometimes we need to look more closely at the township range section to see more specifically where the material came from or you know, what about aspect and microclimate. Um, that's information that we collect on the um, FM44, which is the collection report. We'll talk about that more in, in uh, part two. Um, and we, we feel confident that we can move seed within a seed zone if it's a similar enough environment to be adapted if it's in the same elevation band. But it's obviously not best to move something um, at 500 foot elevation near the coast to 500 foot elevation inland. We would never do that. It's a completely um, unacceptable environment for a change. But how far can a seed source be moved? There's a lot of talk about um, climate change effects and moving things about. And um, I, uh, we'll talk more about that in just a minute. Um, but this is collecting the seed, and, and that's more deployment issues. So um, we always felt, you know, how far can a seed source be moved? You know, we, we know that some species are specialists. Some are generalists. Some are broadly adapted. Some are narrowly adapted. Um, generalists usually have more adaptive traits, so they can be moved further. Um, Doug fir, lodgepole pine, um, there are other species that occupy a very narrow niche, and we don't feel confident moving them um, around as much. 
We also know that material from the center of the range has more diversity than crops um, at the edge of the range. There's less frequency at the edges of the range. There's less diversity. Um, so if a, a seedlot has more genetic diversity, we feel that we can move it a little bit farther. Um, a special case is giant sequoia. Um, outside of seed zone 534, there are 75 to 78 groves, which are remnant populations with a reduced gene base. But outside of 534, um, giant sequoia seed is being fenced all over the world. Um, but within seed zone 534, tests show maximum diversity for this source. It performs best worldwide. Um, so when you move north and south of seed zone 534, um, we don't have the same um, success rate in terms of moving it around. Also, a north aspect or a dry southern exposure, we have to think of microclimates. So that's information we collect when we do collect seeds, so foresters can uh, make good management decisions when they're thinking about deploying. Um, I, I think, and I, I think the talk is that, you know, it's the specialists that we're going to be most concerned um, about failing um, in terms of climate change effects and, you know, moving things, migrating things. Um, if they're narrowly adapted, um, they may not survive as easily as something that is more diverse um, and can be moved a little bit farther. It has more adaptive traits. So within a stand, it's highly likely that many individuals are related. So if we have seed from many stands, we're more likely to have some individuals that are well adapted to most local variations like site, aspect, and disease resistance. Um, the best approach to avoid inbreeding and decreased vigor of the progeny is to collect from widely spaced trees in a stand. Um, so we, we like to collect trees that are quite separate from each other. Um, we want to collect from a number of different trees within a stand and an equal amount from each. That's why we have a two bushel per tree maximum. We want our collections of 50 to 100 bushels to come from you know, at least 25 trees for a 50 bushel lot. It would have to be you know, 50 trees for a 100 bushel lot. We're, we're collecting from many individual trees so that we can maximize our genetic base. We want to collect from a number of different stands within an elevation band. Um, as long as it's in the same general area, definitely within the same seed zone. Um, stands, different stands in an elevation band um, can constitute a seed lot. Um, again, we want to define a stand by um, considering it separated by 200 yards from adjacent collection area. Here are some of the things that we look at um, when surveying or considering collection areas. Um, the, characteristic, the characteristics such as growth rate and form, um, fast growth rate, um, straight stem, these are heritable and they vary very widely between individuals. Trees with good favorable characteristics, good phenotype. Um, they may be genetically superior to the neighboring plants with, that, have, that might have less desirable traits. Um, so we want to make sure that we're collecting the best looking trees um, in the stand. We want to avoid those that you know, have insects or disease, that um, have big wolfing habits or you know, large branch size. Um, these characteristics are what we're looking for. High vigor, full compact crown, straight stem, small branch size, branch angle, um, and free of obvious defect. Um, trees with mistletoe or other diseases sometimes have a very heavy crop, but we don't collect from these trees. We also want to avoid isolated trees. Again, those are trees that are isolated and at least 300 feet from the nearest stand of the same species. They're likely inadequately pollinated. And we want to avoid cones on the lower branches. They're often selfed, um, self-pollinated, and, and not as vigorous. Um, good planning would be to choose the trees in advance and mark them. And just some last thoughts. Um, having looked now 
at the historic zone elevation leanings for collecting and cataloging seed lots. Actual deployment practices need to be closely examined as we're transitioning to forward-looking restoration that promotes resiliency in a changing environment. Um, but it's still most important to collect seed source information um, so that we have a complete profile of the collection area and the conditions. Um, this will allow uh, forest owners and managers the tools that they need to make the decisions when they're actually deploying seedlings. Um, so, you know, what's thriving? Um, if, if we know what the site is and the aspect and the lat latitude and longitude, what are the associated plants in the area? This is all information that we need to collect when we're doing seed collections. Um, we want to use a mix of genetic material with a more diverse species mix. We want to use improved genotypes that are more adapted to temperature and moisture extremes. Um, surveys and site certification um, are therefore very, very important and more important than ever to assist with sound deployment practices. Um, so again, having looked at you know, the, the same talk we've been having over historic zone elevation leanings, I think what we're doing and collecting in terms of seed collections, um, I don't know how much we would change about that, just collecting as much information as we possibly can to give you know, forest owners and forest managers whatever tools they need to make the decisions on the ground. So that concludes part one of the cone crop survey um, part the col and collection certification webinar. Um, you can join me next week where we're going to talk more about um, the Cal Fire collection standards, sampling procedures, the collection site certifications. We'll review cone and seed assessments and maturity. And again, if there are any questions. Thanks, Terry. Uh, there are, uh, is one question I see already um, from Jay, and he doesn't give his first name, Bolden. Um, are the survey forms uh, in a database or otherwise accessible to researchers? No. You say you have thousands of those. I do. Uh, and they go back to pre-1980. And honestly, they're just paper forms in document boxes. Um, I have pulled them out on many occasions in, in recent years. The Forest Service has asked, asked for information. And we generally have kept um, good information across years and have been able to look up survey forms and provided other information that they could relate to um, animal populations. You know, if, but on, uh, sadly, a lot of hardwoods aren't collected, and, and most of the information was asked about you know, mast events, acorns, and things like that. And um, we don't necessarily have a complete file of, of hardwoods and, and other um, types of trees besides conifers. And there have been years when there have been low um, staff levels and the information is not complete as well. But essentially, it's a lot of document boxes with a lot of paper forms. Uh, you know, uh, regarding masks, uh, there's two things that I wanted to mention. Um, you know, this is we're going to talk about this next week. But uh, Walt uh, Koenig, who uh, used to be at the Hastings Reserve and now is retired, every uh, year he compiles the California Acorn Report where they basically he uh, gathers information on the mass production on California oaks um, all over the state. Um, I have the latest copy of that from October 2013. Uh-huh. And uh, have you ever seen that? No, I have not. Um, I'll, I'll uh, try to make this available somehow on the website because it's a very interesting document. I know. Uh, Department of Fish and Game, now Fish and Wildlife, used to do mass surveys as well. I think they still do uh, in terms of mass production in uh, deer winter range. But um, kind of, kind of uh, interesting. There is this kind of parallel for hardwoods, but it's a sort of hit or miss. Let's see if there's any more questions. Oh, uh, so Jay Bolden is asking. <laughs> If there's a chance of getting the data from the SWARMS database, I guess. It's possible. I think it would be a great student research project. Um, it's, not, it's certainly not 
something that we're staffed at a level to, to get data-based. Um, but I think it would be a great student research project. What would you see as a potential utility of, that, of those data? Well, I think it shows historically, you know, what we can expect with cone crops, or we can see if the effects of climate change are uh, is something that we can seriously calculate. Um, again, it it differs by species. It it differs by area of the state. Um, you know, so if you look at the cone crop survey, when when a report is done at the end of the year, it's just a lot of general information. And the average rating that is collected across all zones, usually it's not very impressive at all. Um, but what I think what would be helpful is to go back and look at smaller regions um, and look at what the cone crops were in, in a particular area across years. And that would um, give you a better idea. Um, you know, we haven't always been able to take advantage of cone crops when they were available. Um, so sometimes the information came from the level of cone pro um, processing that the, the center was able to do. So I can see in our records that we had, you know, 1980 was just a huge, massive ponderosa pine crop in the entire um, Cascade and Sierra range. We still have hundreds of pounds of seed in the seed bank from 1980, Ponderosa Pine. We have the oldest seed that I have in the seed bank is from 1963. And I have Douglas fir and Ponderosa Pine. So again, if, if the seed is um, woody and protects the tissues inside, uh, you know, we used to think seed would be viable for 30 years. 40 years, but we've got seed that is still germinating well, um, at least from 1963, because we still have some in the bank from those years. But you can see the years that we're, we did heavy collections must have been um, years in which there was pretty good cone production around. So if it, if it doesn't say in the actual report based on the, the survey forms that were turned in, and it's been done differently over the years as well. So um, it, it would take quite a bit of doing to figure out far back you know, what the information actually, uh, what could be gleaned from it. But I do have cone crop survey reports that date back to 1958. So you can see reports as they were done. You know, I don't have the actual forms, but I have the final um, report. Sounds like uh, uh, Jay Bolden should uh, uh, come visit you. <laughs> it sounds he's like it. Yeah, it like, sounds like because he's another use he's, uh, he's, he or she is indicating would be to look at the consistency of crop quality spatially. Uh, but there wouldn't be any GPS coordinates from the 1980s. No. I guess it probably wouldn't even be from the 1990s. No. No, no. Th most of the GPS information has just been in the last five or six years. Yeah, I, I, I hope like that anyone who does go and back and looks at all of these document boxes filled with paper forms won't be too disappointed. It's just a lot of um, information. Some of it may not be as reliable as we would want it to be. Um, you know, we've found surveys being done by folks who really didn't know what they were looking at. Um, that's the purpose of doing the cone collection workshops that we've been doing. Uh, of course, Lori Lippitt started you know, way back in the early 1980s. I, I had the privilege of working with Lori Lippitt for 17 years before she retired in 2002. Um, and we're just, we've just continued to hopefully add information as we've gathered it and tried to get the message out about this is how you do surveys, this is what we're looking for, and how to assess crops. But honestly, I, I get survey reports um, every year where um, I suspect that the information is not accurate. But a lot of that is alleviated by a telephone call. I'll just call and say, OK, what, what do you really see? And, um, or we're able to go out and take a look at things. So some of the information that's been turned in may not even be accurate. But um, it's, it's the best that we have. Um, I'm sorry to say, in some cases, it's not great. Uh, following up on that, Marcus Rosenberg is uh, mentioning that 
the survey forms would have township range and section on them, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, so and often they're question. accompanied by okay. a map. Often what? They're accompanied they by a map? often are accompanied by a map oh, that shows where, uh, where the surveys are actually done. Hmm. Well, there we go. I'll send Jay Bolton over to your office <laughs> right away. With <laughs> okay. Uh, so David Hodge has got an interesting question. Is there a zone-based seed bank for non-commercial species, such as hardwoods? Um, there actually isn't. We tried to collect some of these species, but they don't store well. So if, if you can't dry something down um, and store it in our freezer, um, then we can't keep it for very long. We, we This nursery at the LA Moran Reforestation Center, of the three nurseries in the, in the CDF system, CAL FIRE system, um, this was the container operation, and so we did grow more of the hardwoods um, and desert species and mine reclamation sites and some non-conifer things. Um, but those were always fresh collected. Some things could be dried, like the prunus could be um, some prunus, not all, um, but most the laurel, dogwood is not a. It was a stone fruit, but we weren't able to store that for very long. Um, shrubs, the same thing. We ha we do have some in the bank, but um, they've lost a lot of their viability over time. Uh, this is uh, the question of the other species, the hardwoods and the shrubs and such. Uh, will be addressed next week by uh, Rich Marovich, who will we'll talk about the propagation um, methods he's been using right there at L.A. Moran. Um, yes, so, he's using a part of our site to grow some plants. Yeah, so that uh, we will be uh, covering that a little bit. Um, also, for those of you that are interested in processing of acorns, um, you, you might want to go to the um, the UC um, Oak uh, Hardwood Program um, link, which you can get from the uh, Forest Research um, website, you can get to that to the Oak um, link, and they have a whole bunch of information on uh, collecting and processing acorns. Yes. So, uh, so there is that kind of stuff, but that, that's a really sort of specialized niche. I think that's being filled by a few growers around. Cornflower Farms is one of them, I guess. Is, is that right, uh, Terry? Yes, they, they are a more local source of, uh, but again, they're restricted to what's available in any given year. It's a recalcitrant, a recalcitrant species um, tend to not store well. We can't dry them down, so they don't last very long. You have to store them at a higher temperature, typically 35 to 41 degrees Fahrenheit. And um, uh, those are perfect conditions for mold formation. And usually yep. within a year time, um, trying to save it for the next sowing season, you've lost 75 to 100 percent of your seed. Um, they just don't store. So you can get a lot of you know you get a lot of good infra information too from uh, remember the old Woody Seed uh, Manual. Oh, of course, the I have the Woody Plant um, Seed Manual, and and there's also there's a there's an old publication that UC put out on uh, shrubs and propagating shrubs uh, for really for uh, wildlife and browse value. So uh, you have to kind of dig for this stuff. But there really was a lot of information that was generated, I think, really in the 50s and 60s on there was. Uh, yeah, wildlife improvement. The uh, um, if folks, the Woody Plant Seed Manual was, was rewritten um, a few years ago. I have a copy of the new version. But it's also available um, online. Um, you can go to the uh, National Seed Lab, the, the Forest Service National Seed Lab website. Um, and I, I have that on my last slide of the next part, um, but it's, um, I can tell folks what it is right now if they can't wait, but it, it, you can Google now.